I'm from, yeah, I'm very happy to be here and participate in the workshop. Um, I'm from the University of Passau in Germany. It's located uh, in the south to the, at the border to Austria. And um, today I will talk about um, the workshop paper carrying the name a uh, longitudinal study of content control mechanisms. Um, today in the morning, the keynote of Stefan was pretty interesting, and he also talked about web crawling, and that's also what um, this talk will um, about, at least partially. And um, this name does not give away too much, so I want to shortly, um, yeah, say you some few more words about it. So content control mechanisms, as I said, um, already it's going into the direction of web crawling. So it wants to answer the question how um, content creators and publishers of web content, so not only social media, but I'm talking here about all kind of regular web documents, HTML <coughs> documents, um, how all how people who put that kind of web content online are able to control how their content is accessed and used by others. Motivated, it is of course by the recent biggest event, the breakthrough of ChatGPT and also other uh, applications of generative AI, which caused a uh, big concern among all people who um, create and publish content on the web as large language models are able to um, imitate and reproduce the data that they were trained on and as a consequence data which was put online loses might lose its authenticity or value if it is reproduced so it, there is a yeah, big concern, which um, is true for all publishers, but particularly the large ones, as for, you see here, New York Times or Getty Images are actually filing legal actions due to copyright infringement. As a consequence, this led to an increased awareness for data control and sovereignty and Publishers want to keep their data out of the training data sets for, of generative AI models. And how can they do so? This is the question that uh, yeah, stands as the motivation here. Technically, it's possible um, by restricting the web crawlers. Um, and morning, Stefan mentioned that there are APIs for getting um, web interesting uh, web data from, for example, social media pages. But on a rather general term, the software to use here are uh, yeah, crawlers that automatically traverse the web in order to collect data on a large scale for, um, for example, search engines or uh, digital libraries. To the use of APIs is rather the exception of the rule, I would say. These web documents, or also the web servers that host the web documents, then contain um, yeah, terms of use that they put on the content itself. A very important protocol um, in that regard is the robots exclusion protocol, which I will introduce shortly. Another way of doing so is specifying license-related meta information in the web document. That is rather fine, more fine granular um, in comparison to the robots exclusion protocol, which is, as we will see later on, um, rather common, but coarse-grained. Um, I put here in a screenshot of the robots exclusion protocol of New York Times, just as an example, it is always in the root directory of a website and hosts information in a machine readable way that is accessible to web crawlers. Um, as I said before, New York Times is uh, in a lawsuit against um, 
uh, OpenAI, I think. So yeah, their robots.txt robots file is also very verbous, as they have really incentives to protect their data. They specifically say in a comment at the beginning here that they want to prohibit the development of any software such as machine learning, artificial intelligence, and or large language models. And it pretty much sums up what a lot, what is the intention of a lot of um, content creators and publishers, which um, yeah caused the current I would say debate or discussion on web publishers control. Robots.txt files then contain user agents. The star here is the general global user agent as the wildcard, and um, this user agent instruction line is followed by this allow or allow rules, which specify the URL path pointing to the, the content on the website. Furthermore, um, down the robots.txt file, you see more user agents which are excluded, meaning that the crawler with the corresponding name is not allowed to access and further on use any content on that website. So in our work, we were looking at previous web crawls in order to answer the following two questions. The first one is, um, what are the prevalent mechanisms to put condition on the usage of web content? And the second one is, what are new technical approaches in response to the current debate on web publishers' control? And what is their uptake? Are they really used or are they just good ideas? Therefore, we used existing crawl dumps from Common Crawl, which with whom we collaborated in this work and parsed um, regular web pages. That what I mean here, it's a rather informal term, but what I mean here is normal HTML documents, as well as robots.txt files from the time period between 2016 and 2023. Since 2016, these uh, yeah, regular crawl dumps of particularly robots.txt files are available online. So to answer the first question, uh, what are the prevalent mechanisms to, that put, to put conditions on the usage of web content? Um, as I said before, we have seen that the robots exclusion protocol, I introduced it as a rather um, coarse grained way of limiting the access to websites to website content, but it is actually the commonly agreed standard between websites and crawlers. Not only um, do we see a very high number of, uh, very high percentage of adoption among websites with um, over 50%, which has not been changed in the last eight years, but also a, the adherence to the robots exclusion protocol is the definition of politeness for crawlers. So if a crawler um, is polite, means it adheres to the, to the specification in the robots.txt files, T files. So it is a commonly agreed standard. But um, the study also made clear that we have to keep in mind that a normal um, yeah, website owner is not as deep into the technical, um, yeah, not that deep into the technical specification as one might hope for or one might expect. A lot of them do only use like templates from the content management system they use, or they use a very short file. So um, it kind of grounds the um, assumption that you put on the operators of websites. They might not even know what a robots.txt file is. Not all of the operators of websites know this. They don't know why it would be a good idea to put the 
terms and conditions on the use of their content out in a machine readable way. They um, yeah, use default or short robots.txt files. Um, further on, we looked at the license related meta information that um, we, could f we can find in the HTML pages. These are in contrast to the robots exclusion protocol, which is, as I said, which can be commonly found and which is a very prevalent standard. This can, uh, is not true for license related meta information on web pages. They are only partially used. Um, if we look at, for example, the um, license microformat or the license term in the uh, Dublin Core meta, uh, defined by the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative, these are used um, under on under one percent of the web pages, which um, somehow yeah questions the effectiveness of such measures as the crawler cannot fully rely on it even though it's a very good idea to use them but as i said before in contrast to the robots exclusion protocol if the adoption among websites is that kind of low it is difficult to yeah call it an effective mechanism of actually putting conditions um, that will be considered by the crawler The second question is, what are new technical um, solutions that came up in response to the debate on web publishers' control and what is their uptake? In another work, we looked at a list of um, ideas and initiatives that came up in, at the end of 2022 and during 2023. Some of them are scientific publications, some of them are um, yeah, web standards, and some of them are also quite practical solutions from tech companies. And unfortunately, none of them is um, used in, in a wide, more or less widespread way besides the um, extended user agent from Google. And that one I want to uh, talk about a bit more. So this is a scroll down uh, just a bit further. The robots.txt file from the New York Times, and you also find that user agent from Google, Google Extended here, which is one of many user agents that particularly define a content usage for the development of the respective um, AI applications of, in that case, Google. There are also other um, that kind of AI data scrapers. Um, Google has their own now, which they call Google Extended. But the same is true for GPT Bot, which, yeah, also collects data for the development of the respective AI products, just for another company. Um, here, I want to point you to that link, darkvisitors.com. There's a whole list of that kind of AI scraping tools. And unfortunately, as you see here, if someone decides to, like, to keep one's data out uh, from the training data sets, unfortunately, one has to specify all of these AI data scrapers. And if a new one pops up, the current way of doing is uh, just adding it to the list to um, yeah, be sure that one state is not used for training generative AI. These kind of usage specific user agents, I called it that way because they particularly define a usage, namely um, developing AI products. These kind of user agents uh, experienced some significant uptake as they are used in more than um, 650,000 robots.txt files, even though they were introduced just um, 
um, at the moment of capturing that number around six months back. As a last point in this talk, I want to look at the user agent bias and interesting um, yeah, notion regarding these kind of agents. And the notion of bias was introduced by Sun at Ale in 2007. And it basically defines a number which should um, give us more insights about whether a user agent or web crawler is uh, positively or negatively biased, preferred or avoided by um, the robots.txt file, saying that the number of directories and consequent the amount of content um, and documents on a website is yeah, more or less than by the global or any random user agent. In the first part of the uh, plot, we see here four search engine crawlers, which are more or less uh, biased or not biased. They are more or less around the zero line here. Um, we see that the bias was a bit decreasing over the years between 2016 and 2023. Overall, Googlebot is preferred uh, the most, which makes it kind of plausible as it is the biggest search engine. But um, that kind of serves as a, a, as a reference for also um, the others. Here um, we see more data scrapers, for example, SEO bots um, or the Internet Archive bot. They also around the zero um, and the petal bot as well, which is quite an outlier that might be due to some headlines, particularly that one from 2020, which says that it behaved very, very um, aggressively and is that for that reason punished by yeah making it um, or disallowing it in the robots.txt file. And now to the interesting part, let's look at the new AI data scrapers or um, in case of the CC bot, um, user agents which were made to as uh, AI data scrapers. They are as well negatively biased, which kind of gives away a stance of the um, operators of websites, websites which are clearly um, avoid the uh, yeah th their content to be used for um, yeah to be scraped by AI companies. That is underlined by the next um, measure that we look at, which is the frequency of disallow all instructions. As here on the left side, you see an example. It just means that. Um, in the robots.txt file, a particular user agent is categorically disallowed, which is basically the case for the petal bot, which is kind of an outlier, as we saw before, as well as all these usage-specific user agents. So the takeaway here is as soon as a, for example, GPT bot is in a robots.txt file, it's basically used for disallowing all content, which again, as I said before, gives away the stance of the operators of websites. Um, coming to the conclusion, so at the beginning, we um, said that the training data sets might contain the content, um, might contain web content without the consent of the rights holders of these data, which is the author or publisher, depending on the case. And that led it to problems, namely, it led it to a big discussion on the topic of web publishers control. Um, we found out that the robots exclusion protocol is regarding that discussion, the most common, also most effective solution, even though it's rather coarse-grained, particularly coarse-grained in comparison 
to other ways of specifying meta information on websites. But for example, um, yeah, specifying meta informa information that point to license, for example. Here you can specify conditions which are way more fine grained. But unfortunately, these kind of um, technical um, so approaches are only partially used. At least they're not as commonly used as one could call it an effective way of actually communicating terms and conditions to crawlers as their adoption is too low, which is um, kind of counterintuitive because new legal regulations as for example the um, the copyright um, protection regulation um, in the EU, which is called um, Directive on Di the Digital Single Market, which was re released, I think, in 2019, particularly mentions the importance of um, machine readable um, annotation of, of uh, yeah, content, web data particularly. Nevertheless, we barely find it, which, um, yeah, it's in that way kind of sad. These user-specific user agents, as for example, the um, Google Extended or GPT bot, they experience some significant uptake and we can find them in the robots.txt file, even though they were released just last year, but still they seem to be the um, most effective way uh, for uh, publishers to keep their data out of training data sets. Um, and we furthermore saw that the clear stance of the operators of websites, which is expressed by, um, yeah, for example, the categorically categorical disallow in the robots.txt file. Then I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs>